Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us possibly our most returning guest other than comedian Dave Smith, David Petruzza, who's who will correct me on how to pronounce his name because that's addressed in his new book, has written several books, which I've read cover to cover, which include 1920, the year of the six presidents, his book on the 1960 presidential campaign between Kennedy, Lincoln and Nixon. Um, 1960, wait, wait, hold on. Say Kennedy, what? Lincoln, and Nixon. I don't think you it, read that book. In 1960, no? Right. You said Kennedy, Lincoln, and Nixon. Yeah. Oh, uh, Lyndon Johnson. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, okay. No wonder it was so confusing. I was wondering why the South, uh, then you also had 1948 about Harry Truman's upset victory and 1933 about the year Hitler and FDR came into power. And TR's Last War. Did I get that right? Uh, TR's Last War, right. 1932 is the name of the book, but you're right about when they came into power. Uh, 1932 is when they're running like crazy when and when Roosevelt beats Hoover uh, and Hitler runs twice or uh, for the presidency that year. And, but they don't take power until January and March 1933, respectively. But what we are here to discuss is your new book, too long ago, a Rust Belt tale. What I was excited about this, I went to the studio, which I rarely do with these COVID times, and there's a package, and I'm like, oh, good Lord, what are these dimwits mailing me in the mail? And I was ecstatic to see your smiling little face uh, on the cover. Do you remember taking this picture, by the way? I don't remember the picture, but I, you know, I, it was, it, we didn't take a lot of pictures back then. Photography was, you know, it wasn't like maybe in the Soviet Union, but you know, it was a it was a big deal. We had an uncle, my uh, my aunt Pearl's husband, with Sal would take pictures. There's probably a guy like him in every family. He'd take pictures of everything, and then you would never see them. <laughs> <laughs> you never see. I think the camera was empty or something. I don't know. So let's talk about this book because this was your this was something which I think affected me on a personal level. Obviously, you're talking about a different era than mine. But I when we came to the States late 70s, we grew up in Bensonhurst, which was a very ethnic Brooklyn neighborhood. And what you're painting is this picture of a few generations before that, but of an upstate New York where everyone was kind of in their own ethnic neighborhoods. And it's a world that's kind of vanished away. And, you know, this it's kind of fall into this Rust Belt situation and you tell that story. Can you give me an idea of what made you decide to write this book? Well, um, two things, two things. One, a, a very close friend of mine had been after me for several years to write my memoir, which I thought was the absolutely worst idea I've ever heard. Because, you know, who's, who's going to be interested? Who's going to buy it? What do I say in it? Who do I offend in it? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of reasons not to do it. And I guess two Januaries ago at her, we, we took her out for her uh, birthday. And she says, will you, will you do it as a present, a gift for me? And I said, no, I will not do it for you. Won't do it for it. And, and then what happened is one of my close friends who was not in this book because I met him later, had a massive stroke. And within a week, he was dead. And, oh and I thought, you know, the stories die with you. And so, so write them down. And I thought I might, you know, come out with some glorified booklet of maybe 20,000 words. And I wanted to cut it off at my, when I go off to college, just to deal with my childhood, to avoid all sorts of, of, of problems of, you know, this and that and all that. And also, you know, the, the whole scope of it and the world is, was not, you know, 
waiting with bated breath for my full autobiography. So uh, maybe I do 20,000 words. And within a couple of months, I had like 70,000. And then as, as you know, you start throwing words out and you put more words in and then you figure out what you're going to do with it. And, and there it was. And I think it, I think it does speak to a lot of people and it, it tells a story not, not very often told. We're, we're sort of the forgotten, you know, the forgotten man, as FDR might have said. Well, one of the things that you talk about a lot is the Polish American experience, which if you read the New York Times, you're gonna, they're going to pretend it didn't exist. Um, and not only that, that's in the context of what happened in Eastern Europe, where Poland were the victims back and forth of Hitler and then Stalin and just kept trading places. And of course, this preceded Hitler and Stalin, Stalin to a large extent. Am I fair to say that uh, you guys hate Hitler as much as we do? Like, are, th- are those... <laughs> Are those the two groups which were like compete in terms of our hatred for there Hitler? Were, there were six million inhabitants of pre-war, pre-World War II Poland killed. Uh, three million were Jews and three million were ethnic Poles. Uh, they suffered a lot. Uh, and of course, and, and, and not only from the Nazis, okay? Yeah. A million... I think a million Poles may be killed or or de- deported uh, to Siberia right off the, uh, you know, right from the partition in August, uh, 19, August, September 1939 into Siberia. So it's, you know, there's a book called about Poland by an Englishman because they write such great history uh, called God's Playground. And it's a history of Poland. And, you know, and it, it gives you a sort of... It, you have the Polish stoicism and you have a sort of Polish pessimism because things can go wrong. And, and, and when, when you, when you go from the largest nation geographically in Europe to disappearing off the map of Europe for 150 years, and then more things go wrong after that, you know, you realize things can go wrong. And the part of Poland where my ancestors came from called Galicia, Southern Poland, the Austrian part, uh, not quite as beat up, not beat up as much or at all religiously as if you were under the, the Lutheran imperial German regime or the Orthodox uh, Russians. You know, they were Catholics, too. So they let you alone on, on that, which is, you know, thanks be to God. But uh, it was the described as the poorest c- province in Europe. And 50,000 people a year could simply starve to death. So millions got to got the hell out. So if, if that's your 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 background and then you 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 find your ancestors, uh, not too many generations thereof, settling into some sort of prosperity marred by, you know, the Great Depression and a couple of world wars in upstate New York. And then you see the rust start to appear on the rust belt. And in, in my town, it happened very, very early on, January 1955. And then, boom, downhill. And the, the place now is, is, is really, uh, it, it's never recovered. It's, it's tried all sorts of things, and it ain't happened. Uh, I was born in what had been formerly Galicia and Lvov. So, you know, we were probably uh, neighbors to some extent. And I've known people of Polish ancestry my entire life. You know, we're cousins. As a historian, can you tell me where these Polish jokes came from? Because <laughs> I've, but I've never known Polish people to be particularly unintelligent or uneducated. And it seems like such a bizarre non sequitur. And you don't mention your book, which leads me to think it's something more recent historically. Um, we, we, you know, you do get that dumb Polak reputation. Right. And it, it, it really peaked uh, in maybe the 1970s or so. I, I, I don't know. It became very uh, spoken of. of it, it, was, it was something that was out in the open at that point. And then it, it, it passed very quickly because, you know, then the Italian Americans were saying, well, you can't say about the mafia and people were, you know, nobody could say anything about anything anymore, yeah. but, but it was, it was really out there. And I think, it, I think, I think it's probably still, you know, shall we say whispered about, but wh- how it starts, I mean, their language, their command of the English language had to be very, 
poor. It's it's um, it's a tough language. It's a tough language to, to pronounce and, and 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 to get through. And then to go from that. And, and one of the things which we don't uh, recognize is that, OK, the Russians, the Greeks, they have a different alphabet. But the Poles sort of have a different alphabet, too, which makes sense for them. But there are all these accent marks which tell you to where to go. And and then you come into English, as you know, which is incredibly inconsistent, you know, uh, language because it it has so many origins. And, you know, it's got four four words for this and, and they're all pronounced differently at the beginning or the end or 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 with the accent on whatever. Uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about is a lot of people who watch the show and who I interact with their social media are um, blackpilled in the sense that they think we're screwed. The West is done. Like all hope is abandon all hope. All you who enter here. If they had been grown up where you had grown up, that perception would have been accurate. There was no turning that ship around as the factories start to close down, as the jobs leave. And when that happens, you know, things start to spiral and have their own, you know, very dark momentum. Can you tell me what that was like growing up and seeing that start to happen? And it, are there parallels to today? One of the, the, the first memory I have of an overnight trip as a kid would have occurred when I was um, five years old, four years old or so. And my father had packed uh, myself up, my mother up in, in the car. And we drove to a town called Thompsonville, Connecticut. And why there? Because when the place where he worked, which, which was the Bigelow Sanford Carpet Mills, Amsterdam, it's Amsterdam, New York is my hometown. It's in the Mohawk Valley. Uh, it was uh, the rug city, the carpet city. It had not only Bigelow Sanford, but it had Mohawk carpet mills and there have been mergers before that. So the whole industry was largely, not entirely, but largely based on carpets. And that's where the really good jobs were. And so his, they pull completely out of Amsterdam in January 1955. The buildings are put up for auction. Essentially, nobody wants them. They're assessed at millions and millions of dollars. And, and the bids that come in are, are pitiful. So these lousy sweatshops come in, these minimum wage jobs where before you had, you know, good paying jobs, you had a certain skill making carpets. And, and now my father was left to, you know, tote that barge, lift that bale. He was working on, on, on the loading docks and stuff, just hauling stuff, you know, on his back. And so he goes and we go to Thompsonville, Connecticut, and what we do, we stay overnight. And then my father walks to the front gates of the other, the surviving Bigelow Sanford carpet mill, just to see where his job went. And then we got in our car and drove back home. That's, that's a hell of a Dickensian sort of moment. But can you tell me, I mean, let's, can, can we chip a little bit away at the Polish stoicism? Can you tell me what that felt like as a kid? And, well, and as, a kid, as a kid, you know, I, I, I only came to realize how horrible a moment that would have been for my parents, you know, and not just the moment of that, but the being told, you know, you're, you're through here, you know, you're through here. And then, then where do you go? Because, you know, Mohawk carpets was, was slowly dying. They didn't go all at once, but they eventually went out and there was not much hope of getting a, a job there. Uh, at one point he got a job at GE in Schenectady as a janitor and that didn't even last. Uh, so you didn't quite know how it couldn't have been as quite as painful for us, but you knew that there was this sense of kind of doom in Amsterdam where something had been functioning quite well and it wasn't good and it wasn't really going to get better. They would bring these, these sweatshops in, minimum wage jobs, and a lot of them wouldn't work either, or they would be, uh, you know, kind of, uh, kind of shifty. Debbie Reynolds' husband, a guy named Harry Carl, came in and to distribute shoes from there. And, you know, he blew up not only that operation, but uh, um, Debbie Reynolds' private fortune. Um, there was a place called Coleco. They made some of the first computers. Oh, they yeah. Kind of, remember the Atom? Of course. Yeah. That was sort of a, they had the Cabbage Patch dolls. 
everything sort of came and, and went and failed. It was like if you weren't coming into Amsterdam to fail immediately, somehow Amsterdam would touch you and cause you to fail. Um, so it was, it was very, very bad. And then the urban renewal, the urban renewal of the 60s, where, you know, I say, you know, LBJ's hero was F FDR and FDR wanted to give every downtown a new post office. And LBJ wanted to give every post office a new downtown. So he wrecked. I mean, he just completely demolished ours. And you see these things probably all across the country where once viable downtowns are, are gone and they put these malls in or or hotels which weren't viable or little strip malls in urban areas. And they they fail one after another after another. And this this was the case. Uh, in Amsterdam. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. Want to talk to you about a sponsor that is near and dear to my butt, Sheath Underwear. If you go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE20, you get 20% off your order. They're not only they're the most comfortable underwear you'll ever own, they'll be so comfortable you will lose the ability to speak. You'll be so relaxed. You're sitting in your chair. You're like, I don't really need to talk. I just need to be relaxed because I have this stretchy fabric made out of moisture wicking technology. It's keeping everything cool, comfortable, and in place. And what makes Sheath unique is it's got a dual pouch technology for both of your boy parts. And I wear them every single day. You could see me on Bridget Fetish's show this week, pulling out the elastic band. If you go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code MALICE20, you get 20% off your order. I like the camo ones. That way, if you're naked in the woods, no one can see you. Uh, and the, I'm so glad that they are our sponsor. And let's get back to the show. There, there's a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm a big comic book fan. And a lot of times people think this is contemporary, but this has been going on for a very long time, at least since the late 60s. The idea that if there's a, some kind of contemporary issue in the zeitgeist, we're going to have the superhero characters promote it to the children. It's very, and when you read in retrospect, a lot of these things sound very dated and tone deaf. And one thing which I hope you be, might be able to speak on is they got their idea in, um, uh, and I think Jane Jacobs might've been the first to put a stop to this. They got the idea in their head about something called slum clearance. And the concept was because these buildings are all run down and kind of not that nice, that's what's causing crime. And if we just destroy entire neighborhoods and put up new buildings, then for some reason, people aren't going to be poor and criminals anymore. I have never even understood what the reasoning is supposed to be. Can you explain that to me? I, it goes back. It really goes back to, you know, before I guess before the New Deal to the progressive era, you looked at you, you confuse cause and effect. Right. Yeah. Um, the uh, not a few weeks ago, there was a fellow near to my boyhood homes just shot in the head and killed. This would have never have happened, you know, back in that neighborhood. Then there was there was very little crime. In Amsterdam, I mean, there was there was a very spectacular crime uh, which occurred from a, a, a an early the earliest effort from a serial killer. Uh, but generally, things were very quiet, and the neighborhoods kept you know the the term neighborhood watch. And the neighborhood watch was not official; it was all the old ladies and stuff, yeah. you know, sitting on on their porch and having intact family structures. One of the points I make about the community which existed then is that it had been, I mean, in the different areas, I mean, it would be different for the Italian. It was the same principle, but different, different folks, but they would come from maybe the same village. This is, this is the yeah. immigrant experience or was, and I suspect still is in, in, you know, of folks coming in today in larger numbers where one person comes over and then they bring over their, their brother and then their uncle and their cousins whom they number by the dozens. And, and then the community is recreated. So you have this, you have roots which are extended not only and created in America, but which go back to the old country and they know each other. They're related to each other. And also as the jobs get spread out, if you're in Amsterdam, and you're working and then you're forced to work 30 miles, 35, 45 miles away in some office in Albany. Well, you don't know the people in your neighborhood from the place where you work. But it, it really is this this urban village thing. But if you weren't related to these people, 
uh, on, on, the, on the same street or the next street over, your parents worked with them. You know, so I, I talk about going to wakes all the time. Yeah. You know, kids were not shielded from this and you went constantly. It wasn't that there were, people were dying more, but you knew more people. There was more of a sense of, of a real life community. Yeah, it, it seems like a lot of times uh, when you have the state come in to uh, be a safety net, what it's doing is it's preempting what had otherwise been the case where people looked out for one another. And that had the benefit of local knowledge where you knew the difference between someone who was down in their luck and someone who was a ne'er-do-well and who was worth investing that extra time and effort to get back on their feet as opposed to someone where it would just be throwing good money after bad. Yeah, we got, we got both forms of assistance. We were, you know, we could have been thrown out of where we lived, but my we lived with my mother's aunt and uncle. Um, and I mean, it, she had had a tough time during the depression because her father, who was kind of a, well, he wasn't there do well. He was an alcoholic and he was a, un, unable to keep jobs. And, and so they farmed her out to literally to a farm of, of a relative and her sister out to uh, live in, in Michigan. But we were able to keep going in the 50s and be back on uh, on the rent uh, because we lived with relatives and we would get groceries from from some folks. Very nice. I'd say almost holy saintly people who, who would extend credit to us. Uh, but we would also get, you know, government aid. And one of the things which is going on right now uh, where the big debate is, when do you cut off the unemployment insurance? Now, when I wrote this book, you know, I was I was writing before, you know, the COVID thing really hit. And, you know, I put in the book that, you know, one of the issues which was big for us and we, we were Democrats was how long unemployment insurance would would hold up for how many weeks. And, you know, it was like, yes, Democrats, go, 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 go. more weeks, more weeks. But you know, after a while, you realize certain things. It's like, you know, somehow my parents always got a job. You know, when the unemployment checks were running out, so did unemployment. And it was a very perfunctory effort. And if you could stay home and get $35 a week instead of going and busting your back for $42 and get to spend all your time with the cherubic little me, okay, what are you going to do? It's not that they they were bad people or lazy people, but when the government will give you those incentives to just stay home and make it easier for you, well, you will more often than not take that choice. And it is it is a choice which is going to eventually, if you don't get out of it quick enough, is going to rot moral fiber of yourselves, your families, your communities. There's something that I learned from this book that I was very excited about. So one thing I always do when I go to some location is I like to check out their supermarkets and find the weird local brands. And I was in upstate New York visiting my buddy, Josh and Zoe, and we went to Stewart's ice cream shop. And I went through the, all the um, uh, big displays with the sodas and they had something called Vichy water. And I'm like, okay, this this has some kind of weird Nazi subtext. I have to, <laughs> I have to, I have to figure out if, as a Jewish person, I'm allowed to drink this at all. So I bought it, and I did a live stream where I tasted it, and it was horrific. And it's it, what Vichy water was. I looked at the label. It's carbonated water, fizzy water. It's with salt Alka with water added. But to there's it. also, but also Alka Seltzer sitting by carbonates in there as well. And I'm we're trying to figure out on screen whether this is something you drink by yourself. Is it a chaser? Is it a mixer? I Googled around, no one drinks it anymore. And lo and behold, on page 91, you were drinking it as a kid. Can I you loved it. Explain who is drinking it and in what context and why. It, it was a chaser. Okay. It, it really was, was a chaser at that point. Although, chaser for what, alcohol? Yeah, for, for alcohol. And uh, that's, and so we would, we would have it in, I grew up, I like to say, I didn't grow up above a bar. I grew up in a bar. And so I spent, that's, oh, the picture on the cover. Hold up the cover. Sure, well, <laughs> I think we're going to have in the middle third. Okay. Yeah, so, yes. So that's, that's me behind the bar. And so, uh, you know, I would fool around with all these, 
beverages they have, not so much the alcoholic ones, although I remember Molson's Red Label and the, the only wine they had. It wasn't exactly a wine bar, being a working class <laughs> Polish bar. The only wine they had was like Manischewitz. That yeah, was it yeah. for some reason. I don't know why. And probably because it was so sweet, you know. Yeah. And but but Vichy, I would drink by itself and I would drink a, a quart of it. But yeah, I've ha- I've had it recently and it, it's like incredibly salty. It's like, you know, three thousand percent of your your daily allotment of, of, of sodium. But but you know, I like mineral waters and and Sarat- we're very close to Saratoga, okay. which has uh, before you depart for the Great West. You know, every spring, which is, you know, coming up in the middle of downtown and in the perimeter of the area, that's why I call Saratoga Springs, has a different flavor, a different mineral flavor. Some of them are, are really sulfur. sulfur. Oh, yeah. Oh God, that's horrible. But people and drink it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you won't drink it a lot and it will have certain side effects. Yeah, it smells the same going out as it does going yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, there's another town up here called Sharon Springs, which was sort of the northern ed- end edge of the Catskills. Very heavy uh, uh, Hasidic uh, population clientele up there, out in the countryside. You know, you'd be seeing all these cows, and then all of a sudden there'd be guys with the beards and the big hats. And- of course, yeah. Uh, there's a reference in here that I need to know more about because you and I talked about this once when we, when we had lunch. Um, so I knew where it ended, but I didn't know the beginning of this story. Well, let me get this on page 181. Andy Warhol once invited you to a Park Avenue party for Fran Leibowitz, who's one of my two great role models in this stuff. <laughs> what was the background there and what was he like? Well, I, I don't really, <laughs> he invited me. It was through a press agent. Okay? okay. And the deal was, I was, there was. You know, every so often there's an attempt to found a, a new print uh, newspaper in New York. Sure. Usually conservative. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because there's and no usually... need for a new liberal one, right? And it's usually DOA. Yeah. So it's like the New York Sun with Seth Lipsky or, yeah. oh, the, the Moonies had one. And so this was called The Trib. Okay. Okay. It didn't last very long. And I, I did a, I sent in a book review of Fran Leibowitz's Metropolitan Life, which I found to be really, you know, great. It was a great book. And I actually, uh, I looked her up in the phone book. She was living, I think, on the Lower East Side. Yeah. And and called her up and, uh, you know, just congratulated her on it. And then I was at work. Hold on, I got to rewind. So at this time period, it was appropriate to find an author in the phone book and just call yourself them up and introduce yourself? Evidently. <laughs> okay. No, but you didn't think twice that, like, is this going to be weird? No. Okay. No. Okay. I just liked yeah. the book so much. And sure. you know, I didn't know anything about her. I just thought, you know, you know, when you see some, some new talent and all that, and this was not something I ever did. Okay. Okay. Either before I'm just, or or since either. I, I'm just imagining how I'd react if someone called me and said I really liked your book, but it's it's different now because we don't have phone books and We're, no one would ever like my book. So, <laughs> right. I'm over two. So um, the next thing I know, I get a phone call from some representative of Warhol. And wait, wait, hold on, hold on. You're, you're skipping over it. Fran Leibowitz has a reputation of being a curmudgeon, sharp tongued, uh, very not having it. What was her affect like on that phone call? Do you remember? It was it was fine. Okay. It was fine. I mean, it wasn't bubbly. Sure. Okay. And and so I get I get the invite, and it was to the Cafe Regionette, which was some sort of adjunct of Regines, which was a, a you know hot spot of, of that era, which I guess was the late 70s. And time flies. Uh, and so I, I go there. And there were there were like three groups of people at this party. There were um, a, attractive young men wearing very short togas. There okay. were <laughs> there were friends, relatives from Poughkeepsie. Okay. And there were very threadbare looking writers like myself. Yeah. And so Fran was there. I never did get a chance to talk to Andy, Andy, uh, but I talked to Fran. And uh, she recalled the, the, the phone call. 
And she said in this very um, deadpan, Fran Leibowitz sort of way, oh, thank you. You really cheered me up. <laughs> so, so talk to me a little about this era and like people like Warhol. Like it's hard for us nowadays to believe in a world where people thought Liberace was straight. <laughs> was it like known that Warhol was gay or is that something people just assume no one was? I think you assume nobody. I don't know. I never gave much thought to this you know even into the 70s really and certainly in in my childhood it's like you know shouldn't i've been aware of of some of these things or some of these people or, around me and it's like no it was like it was a, a sort of blissful ignorance you know when no, people just didn't talk about it Let's uh, there's something else here that was really, really funny. And I don't know if it was um where was it? Hold on a second. God, there was this hold on. This I, I marked off all the pages that gave me a um oh this is how you it, this I this I, I apologize for for kind of finding this humorous because this is your family and it's obviously very personal, but there was one sense that started a chapter that just kind of was so jarring. I, I think you could see the humor in it. The chapter starts with, it is about this time, maybe a little earlier, that Loretta's mother went insane. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, t- tell me that what's what it was like dealing with mental illness at that time and place, because it's very different from now where people have a better understanding and certainly much more sympathy and empathy for it. It's, um, yeah. Um, you're the, and you know what? people still are very wary about talking about it. So people have, have, you know, I've done a bunch of interviews. I've had, you know, I've people, a lot of people have read it. A lot of people from my old world and neighborhood and city tons and have emailed me, Facebook me, whatever. And you are the first person to mention this. Oh, really? You are okay. the first person to mention this. So, it's still not something that people talk about. In 1985, I ran for alderman of my ward. Okay. My grandmother, who we have referenced, went had lived until 1982. As I knocked on every door in that ward, no one ever mentioned my grandmother to me. Wow, Nobody. Okay. But, and they all knew her, I'm sure. And I, they must have at some point. They mentioned, so, somebody actually mentioned my, her father to me. He had died in 1932. Okay. So the memories were long. And I think no one mentioned it because people can be kind. People can be polite. And, and she was, it was not like she was locked up from 1940 something or 41. Until that point, she was released shortly thereafter and lived in the neighborhood and would just, you know, wander around the streets, you know, babbling to herself. I mean, even though I saw her at least once a day for decades almost, and I never had a conversation with her because she was incoherent and she was incoherent in Polish, which oh, wow. again okay. made even less sense to me because she was born here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but it was it was very it, it was it was something you were uh, very nervous about and you were very nervous about as to how far down in the family tree it would reach. It, do you think it's better the way we have it now where people are more open talking about these issues? <sighs> or is the Polish stoicism still going to win out? <laughs> I don't know. It's. I mean, we, 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 in a way we wear everything on our sleeve and, and, and talk about things too much. Um, but you know, okay. So the person who is the impetus for this book, my friend Mindy, okay. Who begged and begged for me to write it has had many, uh, mental health issues. Okay. And, you know, she'll tell you about it. And we've dealt with that. 
and I've visited her in when she's been in, you know, in institutions. Um, so, you know, we deal with it more, uh, but, you know, the families, of course, had to deal with it more. There were yeah. no social workers to come. There were no real programs to deal with, with it. The family immediately had to deal with it. And again, that, that created some fissures in, in my family because of the three siblings was my mother who dealt with it the most. And, you know, and you always get that with families in some ways, I think I was uh, lucky to be an only child when my, when my parents started to, to go and, and, and needed uh, a lot of looking after because, you know, you, you see the, the surviving children go at it on, on every level, it seems. My concern is with the little Davids out there who don't really have the capacity to understand what's happening to a family member. Um, and, you know, it's tough on kids in general dealing with some stress in, in, in the situation. But if it's kind of something that's not understood and not talked about, I can't imagine that's easy. It was just it was just something we would, you know, we would have to. She lived in her own little apartment, which was until probably the 1970s. Uh, no bathtub, no shower, no hot water. And it was only until her brother, her brother did, one of her brothers did very well. And, and, you know, the word was, he was a millionaire. He may have been a millionaire, but you know, a hundred thousand would have been perfectly fine back then, you know, and actually paid to have the apartment fixed up a, a little bit where she could live. But un until that point, you know, very rough existence a very rough existence for her. But that is, you know, one, one of the questions is, so like, so you're living in this, this horrible area like uh, Amsterdam where there's no future for you. Why doesn't your family just move? Why don't they move to yeah. Arizona where my father's two sisters, two of his sisters moved to? Why don't you do that? Well, you know, there are family obligations that people have. We couldn't leave her and we couldn't take her with us. And so even though it was never discussed in that way, it was pretty obvious that's that's what was going on. Can you one of I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm sure you probably don't know this, but I've decided 100 percent to leave New York after living here. All my I know life. that that's I, I, I can't take it anymore. I, and I can't say I blame you, although conversations like that break my heart because I think, you know, how much I love New York. Oh, for sure. What what? what Happen. I, I don't want to be the last one standing when everyone else kind of left on the lifeboats and you're on Titanic and you're like, they'll be, they're going to come and rescue us. And at a certain point, you're like, they're not coming to rescue us. Uh, one of the things I said, which I don't think people appreciate who are not New Yorkers as a metric of New York City's decline, is that in the last year, it's become normalized to take your stereo wherever you go and play your music in public. Mm -hmm. And this to me was very emblematic of 70s New York. And the thing is, it's not the music in and of itself. I sure maybe I'm being becoming a curmudgeonly old man, but that music in the 70s correlated very heavily with rape, with muggings, with perch snashings, with homes being broken in. Uh, can you describe what New York was back back then before uh, you know, when when Gerald Ford had that famous headline about Ford to New York City drop dead? Yeah, I started going to New York for seriously for work in 1973. Okay. And kept on for ever all. So all the way through the, uh, those, those bad years, the a beam years, I actually yeah. met a beam. <laughs> okay. It was like, I looked into his eyes and there was nothing there. I oh, mean, wow. nothing. Jeez, and, so, uh, yeah. Um, and there was nothing going on in the city. It was if, if you want to see what it was like, go to um, watch uh, that Charles Bronson movie, Death Wish. Not not so much for the, the violence, but for the seediness and the way things were were collapsing. And when you call the cop, no cops came. OK, when you said what's going on there in front of, of, of City Hall? Well, don't bother us. What about the three card money uh, card game across the corner on Fifth Avenue in a very nice area? 
don't bother us, okay? They weren't going near it. It was the same way of non, non-enforcement. Or, you know, when I, I had a place up on uh, East 89th Street, went outside because of noise, okay? And I wasn't an old curmudgeon then. But like, you know, on a Saturday night, these kids making noise on the, on the street. And I went out there and got into a, a, you know, a fight with them all. And one of them kicked me in the, in the, in the mouth, you know, one of these karate kicks, which yeah, in yeah. the movies is always very quick, but this kid was slow. So I grabbed him by the, by the ankles and had him. And it's like, but it's like, what do I do with the other dozen kids? Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So we both all ran for safety, but called the cops. Nobody came. Another time going up to uh, or going down to, uh, I think, the Bohemian National Hall in the 70s for Gilbert and Sullivan performance. And, you know, you're walking back and you see this guy chasing a woman down the street, you know. And and so I I chase after him to help because I think I'm stupid. Okay, and it's the reverse of of the, the thing of objects in the mirror being closer. Once you got close to this guy, you really I realized how much bigger he was than I was. Yeah. But then she kept running. And it was like, I'm not going to chase you through Manhattan to, to keep helping you. But but those events were not all or all in the unemployment offices. Again, unemployment offices. Uh, I used to help design those or design them, actually, and designed a lot of state office building space twice when I was in the one on 54th, West 54th Street near Studio 54. There was violence. OK, in just when I was there in the office, a guy jumped over the counter at somebody. OK, another time I was in the vestibule going out and something broke out. So, yeah, it was. It, and I've I still have the habit to this day, no matter where I'm to turn a corner with a very wide berth so I can see who's around that corner from being in the city in those days. Yeah, I was walking with my friend Cole in bed a few years ago, and he was just like I was on it. I wasn't on edge. But there's a certain way of walking you do as a New Yorker where you're really aware of what's going on in every angle. And he, since he'd moved to New York, bed had been fine. He was completely oblivious to all this. And I was realizing I'm picking up things that I don't have to because this is what I was trained to do when I was much oh, younger. Yeah. But let me tell you, it's that feeling is coming back. I believe that, it. I believe it was starting to come back before COVID. Oh, yeah. When for we sure. were... Well, on one of our last trips to the city, my wife and I, we were near just above Lincoln Center and at a at a street corner, a woman squats down and through her clothes starts peeing on the sidewalk. Oh, my God. You know, and and, you know, being in, say, the garment district where today or a couple of days, Saturday, the Saturday before we're, we're taping this, you know, a, a, somebody was shot at a 7-Eleven. OK, uh, you know, you you get a certain amount of unhinged people around there. That was always a, an unhinged area, but you'd see more and more of that. And then you'd see actual, Oh, little encampments of homeless. You know, it was one, you always saw some guy on the street just laying there, but, but then you started to see encampments on, you know, not particularly bad streets where before that, you know, not long before, you know, we would be staying in Long Island City next to the largest public housing unit in uh, or development in, in the city and probably in the country without any great fear. Because, OK, poor people live there, but they're not all criminals. And, and, and one of the things which was striking me before the downturn, before so-called bail reform and et cetera, et cetera, was in the history of, of humankind. Did I say humankind when I meant to say mankind? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm getting too modern. Um, <laughs> the, the, you know, all the, all, the, all the races of mankind, which were constantly at each other's throats. You know, what is it? 160 languages now spoken in Queens yeah. is not only how tolerant people were in the city, but how actually kind they could be. And I would always tell people from upstate or, or not from the city, you, you, you've got these people wrong. You've got them wrong. They are the best people I've ever met. 
You know, they, they are really so good. And if there is, if there is a way to help you, you go to them and they will help you. We were, again, we were staying in Long Island city, not quite there that by the housing development, but our, our car went dead. And, and the, uh, someone from a little pizzeria, they called some guy and this little, and all of a sudden we know this little Hispanic, Hispanic guy comes running around the corner with a charger and, and he starts charging our car and it doesn't work. And we think maybe we should give him some money and he just runs away again. And I don't know who the hell this guy was, but they would, they, people would, would just help you and, and be so, so good to you. There was a cartoon from those bad New York City years which I think was in the National Lampoon, had to be. Two, car, two panel, uh, California, person is saying, have a nice day to someone. And he's thinking, blank you. New York yeah, is yeah. the next panel, right? Bl- saying blank you. And he's thinking, have a nice day. Because, yeah, well, because in fact, because there is a great deal, great deal of humanity here. But, and it, I think it still is the bulk of people. But there's a number of people, uh, a number of people uh, sufficient to make it hell for everyone else. Hey, guys, Michael Malice here. Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Blocks, Blue Light Sunglasses. Let me give you the heads up, the info you want to have. If you go to blublocks.com slash you're welcome or enter code welcome at checkout, you get 15% off your order. What are they? Okay. You have headaches from eye strain, looking at your computer, your TV, your phone all day. You have trouble sleeping. Some people just get that low-key anxiety. What Blue Blocks has done is created these incredible blue light glasses that block the blue light coming off your screens that causes your eye strain and is making you into NPC. Let's be honest. We're spending a lot of time looking at screens during this pandemic. It's not uncommon. You're going to feel low. You're going to have trouble sleeping, and Blue Blocks is here to help. You get your MG back, sleep better, block out the unhealthy effects of blue light, and they look pretty cool, as you can see in this hipster photo of some random loser that they put up who looks like me for no reason. If you go to blueblocks.com, B-L-U-blocks.com, slash you're welcome, or code welcome at checkout, you get 15% off your order. Let's get back to the show. Would you say that this air of hopelessness, which to some extent is pervading New York now, is similar to that air that pervaded Amsterdam when you were growing up and discussing your book. No. Well, because it's worse. What's worse. I think it's worse because of the Which physical worse, safety. Though? It's worse in the city. Yeah. It's this fear of, it's this physical fear, which you never really had then. Okay. Uh, it was, it was a fairly safe city. And one of your recent uh, podcasts you were mentioning James Q. Wilson. Of course, yes. And James Q. Wilson observed the exact opposite in Amsterdam, where people weren't being arrested, you know, particularly for drunkenness, which there was a lot of. But he involved, he created that broken windows theory, which Giuliani put to work in the city and which worked and yeah. which needs to be put in again. But with bail reform, you know, it's out of it. It's you could elect the most law and order mayor right now and you could refund and superfund the police right now but if if you're going to it's good if it's going to be a catch and release thing right you know it's not going to work so it's up to the state okay and who bears the ultimate responsibility for that more so than de blasio more so than the city council more so than the judges it's andrew cuomo again a one-man disaster wherever he's been he signed that bill he didn't have to sign it Oh, I mean, I, I, if you go to governors to gitmo.com, you can get my T-shirt for what I regard as the compromise uh, position on how to deal with Andrew Cuomo and his cohorts. So uh, you're, 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 pre- you're preaching to the choir. I think it's um, a bigger and bigger choir out there. Oh, I was in the Midwest and the things that they were saying, I can't repeat or this show would get yanked from YouTube. I, I'm uh, shocked and delighted. Uh, to what degree middle America has become radicalized. And I'm also very disturbed by how far they had to be taken to get them to that point. This isn't done because they want to be frothing at the mouth. This is, this is at a certain point, every human, like Taft, your boy Taft, uh, you know, what's that line about even a cornered rat's going to well, fight? Right. Cornered, yes. Yeah. So at a certain point, even the kindest, most amiable person is like, I've reached my limit and I'm not going to budge one more inch for you people. I said very early on during the pandemic, 
uh, shocking people who have known me for decades and, and knowing what I, how I, I love New York or loved New York, that I was not, never going back. And people would fall over when they would hear this. But somehow you, 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 you just kind of know. It's a sixth sense. Even from afar, you know, this is, this is not right. This is not the New York that, that, that was there just a few years ago. And it's my concern is that it's not, you know, New York has lulls. Cities have lulls, of course. Uh, it's still got a great brand name, which not, it does not, which is no minor thing. You know, I, just to be able to say I made it in New York is, is always going to be an accomplishment. But my concern is that it's going to be some version of Detroit in the sense that Detroit was always going to be Detroit. It was always going to be Motor City. It was always going to be the home of music. And at a certain point it didn't. And then there's no, then there's absolutely no reason for Detroit to be an, ent- an ongoing entity. New York certainly has much more advantages than Detroit, but it's getting harder and harder. I, I, and I would love to hear your thoughts. I don't see how anyone who is young and trying to put up their shingle is going to come to New York now. I, I, I would not, I would not No, I mean, there's gotta be other places. And like you say, Austin, it, these things are, are, you know, maybe you'll go to Nashville. I don't know. Right. Yeah. It, it's, the, it's... Uh, once I was in Detroit, maybe 20, 25 years ago, because my wife is from Michigan. So I'm down at this huge bookstore scoping it out before you could buy everything on Amazon. And I'm coming up on some people in the middle of the day. Okay. And I, I, I tend to walk very fast. So I'm coming up behind them. And they turned in Detroit and I saw a look of terror on their faces. And, and it's that terror, it's that fear, which is going to kill the, kill the city. And why should, you know, there's gotta be other places for European tourists and, and, and Asian tourists to go to. There's gotta be more fun, cheaper, safer. It, one, of the, one of the things I think it had to be the safest big city on earth. Uh, yeah. Yeah. At a certain point. And now it's not feeling that way. No. One of the other things you discuss a lot in your book is, and, and this it's it's something that is hard for us to understand today. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Is how how enamored the population was with FDR. It's kind of interesting given what a seminal figure he's been for the Democratic Party, what a major major party in Democratic history and American history has been. That he's not actually really discussed today, even by the left. Um, other than that vague reference to the Green New Deal. Can you explain to people contemporary terms why he was treated with such reverence and what was the perception of him? He was, you know, when, take a look at the millions of people who were on the public payroll, who were, I, the story was that my grandfather helped hand out surplus food from, you know, the, the relief administration under the, the New Deal, um, the building of all those post offices. Amsterdam got a golf course, uh, 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 the dams that were being built, um, the, the, the theater projects, not that it affected Amsterdam, but even, even in, in the city and, and funding the writers' projects. They funded everything. Um, so, and, and I think, you know, they say you can't shoot Santa Claus, you can't beat Santa Claus at the polls. So all of those people had a reason to believe in him. And the thing which, which we're talking about New York fear, once there was that sort of safety net and Roosevelt, Roosevelt, you take a look at Roosevelt hated the dole. He wanted people to work for that check. Now, they weren't necessarily big checks. In fact, some of the unions were complaining and, and, and the left wingers, the communists, the socialists were complaining that these were sort of scab jobs. OK, um, but, you know, it, it it took away the fear, OK, from that, that you were going to just collapse into into one of this Hoover shanty town or something. But the big thing which removed fear had nothing to do with with the programs that we think about. I, I come to the conclusion sort of on my own that the, the best New Deal program, which did the least harm, was the simplest. Fed FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, where the bank 
failures stopped, you know, because everyone had their money out of the banks. They're running on the banks. They're keeping their money in, in tin cans and under the mattresses. And, and there, so there was no money for investment. Once that starts, then the fear goes and there's a base and there's an immediate spurt. So he makes he makes that great first impression, which I don't think Joe Biden is making. OK, <laughs> he's not. It's just not not happening. You know, you can't compare the the first hundred days to the first hundred executive orders, you know, uh, you know, ooh, I repealed the Garden of Heroes. You know, it's like, oh, go away, you know, <laughs> do something useful. But uh, so but and that was not a Roosevelt idea. Roosevelt fought that idea. And also he's very reactive. He doesn't come in with Social Security for a few years. And he doesn't do that until the Townsend plan comes up and roaring. He doesn't do the big tax, uh, soak the tax, uh, soak the rich tax program in 1935 until Huey Long has share our wealth. He doesn't do NRA until the Klansman, Hugo Black, the senator from Alabama, puts in some 30 hours wage law and says you can't sell across state lines unless you know you know un unless you know people are working less than 30 hours a week how the hell does that improve the economy you know so he's he's actually reacting a lot to the the things on the left he's he's machiavellian he's very he's he's a great maneuverer and you don't know where he is and you find an awful lot of his contemporaries basically like ickies or Hopkins or people like that saying, you know, you really couldn't trust him. His there, word really wasn't good. There was this one uh, moment when in 1934, Upton Sinclair, the muckraking journalist who was um, author of The Jungle and many other books, got somehow the nomination to be governor of California. This is the height of the depression, the height of the popularity of the Democratic Party. And he goes to, or maybe it's 38, one of those. No, two 34. People. It was 34. He goes to the White House to meet with FDR and he leaves thinking FDR is agrees with him that to have a plan where profit is illegal. Like uh, Upton Sinclair wanted it illegal to be making profit. Production for use was his idea. And then like five minutes later, like the, the door hasn't even slammed shut. And FDR is issuing a press release about how profit is American and you have to have a right. To, and he's not wrong. I mean, most certainly. No, no. But, but it was such a complete like 180 that people got one impression in the room with him. Then as soon as whatever the weather changed, he's in another direction. Everybody leaves that room thinking that FDR agrees with him. Huey Long, uh, Father Coughlin thinks the same thing. The guys who form the Liberty League from the other end of the spectrum, uh, they have meetings early on. Oh, no, I completely share the goals of your program. And you can tell anyone this. And it's like baloney. It's baloney. Well, so why do you think he, it's he's a schmoozer? He's a great schmoozer. But how do he's you a politician. think that, that that got over so well with the American people? <sighs> Somehow we, the people, the average person thought that they were he was on their side. Okay. And, all, and, and when you bash the rich, you know, after uh, after his first um, 1936, he starts really bashing the rich. There's there's a, there's a real social uh, class warfare going on with Roosevelt after that. And, you know, that that works, gang. It really works. And, and when he's able to play off his enemies so that the Liberty League becomes an asset to him when he can run against the press. You know, it wasn't like Nixon or Trump who starts running against the press. He's talking about that, you know, 85% of the papers are against me. And, and so he plays the underdog and particularly Hearst. Hearst, who is very hated in this country for a variety of reasons, some of them good, some of them uh, overblown. Uh, but so, so he's able to, you know, it, it's almost like his enemies were gifts to him, you know, and Herbert Hoover too. I mean, who wouldn't, look, who wouldn't look good being compared to Herbert Hoover after, after 1932. One of my favorite moment in your book, 1932 was when Herbert Hoover was addressing a rally or something. And there was a telegram sent to him and he opens it up and it says, vote for FDR and make it unanimous. <laughs> yes. 
for those who don't know what the Liberty League is, this is something that in retrospect seems completely crazy that it happened, but it did. You had, because it's one thing how if you have like a Jimmy Carter figure or a Truman figure, right? Someone who's very unpopular within his own party, you see members of the party turn on them. That's just politicians looking out for number one. FDR had these huge majorities in both houses. His approval was through the roof. And you had the 1928 presidential Democratic nominee, um, Al Smith. You had John Davis, who was what, 1924? 1924. 24, who ran against Coolidge. They both turned against FDR within the Democratic Party. It's something if people look up, they just find like shocking in retrospect because you would think they'd at least try to be on his coattails. You you had two other contenders for his nomination in 1932, not just Al Smith, but Governor Ritchie of Maryland and Alfalfa Bill Murray of Oklahoma, you know, very different guys uh, uh, turning on him. You had Breckenridge Long, who was uh, the uh, Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson turning on him and uh, the former chairman of the Democrat National Convention, uh, John Jacob Raska, big pal of Smith, Jewett Schuess, who was the executive director of the Democratic Party, turning on him. And then, you know, it's amazing how many people turn on him afterwards. You know, Jim Farley, uh, his, his postmaster general, the big uh, Democratic machine guy, or his vice president, Captain vice Jack president, and I- John Nance Garner. Yeah, 1940 said he was going to run for president and they had to drop him from the ticket accordingly. I, we can't even imagine a vice president telling the president, I'm going to run for the next. Oh, thing. The, the brain trusters, uh, Raymond Moley, Raymond Moley drops or turns on him. So it's it's a very high level of people who who are close to him and eventually turn on them. But he has he has a big margin for error because yeah. because he has those big majorities, particularly in 32 and, and 36. But he, uh, he almost doesn't win uh, in 36, which sounds weird. The polls are where he would he would he was. There's one poll where he would have lost the Electoral College. In the, but, in the, but I very mean, close. He, ended, he ended up losing only two. As goes Maine, so goes New Hampshire. I think those are the two states uh, that went Vermont, for Landon. Vermont. Oh, Vermont. OK, yeah. that was it. Uh, David, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? You know, I think just seeing you again, which is not to, not to butter you up. OK, and 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 particularly so because I know I'm not going to see you in person in New York again. Oh, yeah. Well, my condolences. Hey, everyone, before we go, if you enjoy this podcast, God help you, you might enjoy some of the other podcasts available at GasDigitalNetwork.com. This week, we're highlighting The Thing Is with host Shannon Lee and Maddie Jester Skulls. You can find the full catalog of episodes on demand at gasdigitalnetwork.com or catch the latest 20 episodes anywhere you find podcasts. Here's a clip. This is the part of the show we talk about weird, creepy, unexplainable, possibly paranormal experiences. Do you believe in ghosts at all? Oh my God, is it a ghost? No. Never. And now I'm starting here. And I walked to the bar, the fucking ice maker was dropping ice. And I don't believe it. My whole family believes this stuff hardcore and I mock them openly. Something or, or I don't know, whatever. I felt what what feels like someone doing this to my hand that was out of my, the covers were over my head. I still can't explain them. One time I just saw um, a gl- glowing older woman. No, ghosts don't exist, Shannon. <laughs> Let me make this very clear. There's nothing, okay. there's no such thing as supernatural. There's no UFOs. There's no ghosts. There's no Jesus or Santa Claus. A being was standing above her, and it made her body lift into the air and then start spinning around in circles like crazy fast, like crazy fast. 